chemical tankers transport a range of chemicals, either homogeneously or in parcels. These may be inorganic chemicals, such as acids and alkalis, petrochemicals, mineral and vegetable oils, and other substances which often represent special hazards to people, the ship and the environment. It is considered good practice that each cargo carried should be accompanied by a material safety data sheet, or MSDS, supplied by the manufacturer or shipper. In this program, we refer to a corrosive chemical, sulfuric acid, a toxic chemical, dichlorobenzene, a flammable cargo, isobutyl alcohol, and a self-reacting cargo, butyl acrylate. Each represents special hazards and requirements in terms of cargo integrity, confinement and segregation on board ship. For this reason, a high level of seafarer training is required as controlled by STCW 2010, Regulation 5 Stroke 1, and Code Section A, 5 Stroke Module 1. Uh, are full cargoes that we are carrying on board. Toxics, this training also extends to personal safety and personal protection, in accordance with the IBC Code. This is of the highest importance as the degree of protection required is determined by the type of cargo carried. If corrosive cargo is loaded, then chemical suits, gloves, boots, goggles and face shields must be worn at the manifold and elsewhere where the possibility arises of the cargo escaping from confinement, especially if loading at high pressure. If toxic cargo is handled, full protection, including self-contained breathing apparatus, must be worn at the manifold and elsewhere where the possibility arises of the cargo escaping from confinement. In some cases, gas suits may be required. Only if neither of these cargoes is being carried and there are no cargo movements in progress can normal overalls, helmets, gloves and eye protection be worn. You must always double check the requirements listed in the material safety data sheets, as you will see later. In any case, periodic or standard monitoring of the atmosphere must be carried out, especially where the possibility of a build-up of flammable or toxic vapours can arise. Controlling the transportation of chemicals at sea involves regulations by SOLAS, Chapter 2, Section 2, the IBC Code, and MARPOL, Annex 2. Further instructions are provided in the ship's own procedures and arrangements, or P&A manual. Officers with duties and responsibility for cargo operations and cargo equipment must be familiar with these codes and regulations and the way they apply to the cargoes they handle. For a ship to transport chemicals, she must have a certificate of fitness. This is issued after a thorough survey of the ship's design, equipment, instrumentation and condition and is renewed every five years. The Certificate of Fitness will also list the chemicals which may be carried. One or several of these chemicals might be carried on board a chemical tanker at any given time. Uh, we will be also doing a cargo here which is sodium methylate. This means that everyone on board must be aware of all the hazards each cargo could represent. The characteristic of this cargo is light brown. The shipper's brown, material the safety total, data sheets will this provide this information for each cargo considered burn, for transportation. Skin, and this is dangerous to aquatic life in high concentration. So this knowledge is vital our, uh, at the two initial stages of, of cargo transportation. In place. First, when head office decides to accept a cargo for shipment, and second, 
when the master and chief officer check the acceptability of the cargo on their ship. So, before a cargo is loaded, the P&A manual and the certificate of fitness must be double-checked. Firstly, to confirm that the cargo can be carried on board the ship, and secondly, to establish any specific requirements for pollution control under MARPOL Annex 2. Liquid chemical cargoes must be confined to tanks that are suitable for the cargo. That means verifying that the tank coating is correct, and for heavy cargoes, that the maximum specific gravity and the consequent filling rate is acceptable. And in order for the tanks to be properly segregated, a compatibility chart must be used to check each cargo for compatibility with the contents of adjacent tanks. Only when all these control criteria have been established can loading be authorised. The IPC code recognises three types of chemical tanker, designated as Type 1, Type 2 and Type 3. Regardless of the type of designation, a ship can only carry chemical cargoes which are permitted within the IBC code for its design and equipment, and as listed in the Certificate of Fitness. Type 1 and Type 2 ships usually have a number of individual cargo tanks, each capable of being cleaned, loaded, heated and ventilated separately. This means that each parcel of cargo can be controlled precisely in line with regulations and the ship's own P&A manual. The tanks will be constructed either of stainless steel, which resists most cargoes, or will have specially formulated coatings to resist specific cargo types. It is most important to verify in the manufacturer's tank coatings acceptability list what coatings will resist the cargo scheduled to be loaded. Good practice requires manufacturers and shippers to supply the vessel with the specific material safety data sheets of the cargoes to be carried. These should be displayed to ensure that everyone on board knows what cargoes the ship is carrying. The data sheets provide all the necessary information about possible hazards and the emergency procedures to be followed in case of fire, unprotected exposure to the cargo, or its escape from confinement. MARPOL Annex 2 categorizes the chemicals as categories X, Y and Z in the order of their degree of hazard to the environment, category X being the most hazardous. In this particular case, the data sheets confirm that there will be four parcels of cargo on board. The hazards they represent include Corrosivity, toxicity, flammability, and reactivity. The cargoes are due to be loaded into segregated tanks, as stipulated in the Certificate of Fitness. And in the case of a self-reactive cargo, an inhibitor is added to prevent the cargo solidifying. Special procedures may arise if the inhibitor specified is oxygen dependent. An inhibitor certificate will be required. Having flammable cargo on board means that all possible sources of ignition, such as matches, lighters and battery operated equipment, must be kept in designated areas only and must not be taken on deck. Battery operated instruments may be used but only if they are the approved, intrinsically safe type. Attention! Tools being transported can cause sparks if dropped. They must be handled with the utmost care. But the most important safety measure when carrying flammable or explosive cargoes is the application of nitrogen 
in the cargo tanks. For cargoes with a flash point of below 60 degrees centigrade, it is now a common requirement that cargo tanks must be inerted. For chemical tankers, this process typically involves replacing the air in the tanks with nitrogen. This will reduce the risk of unwanted combustion. Nitrogen is also used when carrying other cargoes, such as isocyanates and oxides, cargoes that can suffer degradation caused by the effects of atmospheric oxygen and moisture. It is often the charterer's requirements that tanks holding such cargoes are inerted by nitrogen to maintain the cargo specification. Nitrogen is generally supplied by the terminal from a high-pressure supply and requires careful monitoring and control to avoid over-pressurization of the cargo tanks. During the voyage, the nitrogen is maintained using the ship's nitrogen generator or bottled supply. The inert properties of nitrogen make it ideal to protect flammable or reactive liquids from contact with air. However, it is also a very dangerous asphyxiant, which is colourless, odourless and tasteless. Crew must be constantly vigilant to the dangers of nitrogen. All inerted tanks and spaces must be tagged with suitable warning signs. Remember that protective clothing will only provide temporary protection in the event of contact with the cargo. Any contact with a corrosive cargo, for example, may constitute an emergency. Emergency procedures will be dealt with later in this program. It is strongly advised that the company prepare a PPE matrix to be available on board, clearly showing what PPE should be worn relating to all their onboard operations. We have seen that there will be toxic cargo on board. Toxicity can affect you by absorption through the skin and by inhalation. To protect you from being poisoned through inhalation, breathing apparatus must be worn at the manifold and in any emergency situation. The protective clothing will temporarily prevent absorption in case of contact with skin. All operations on chemical tankers fall into one of two categories, routine and non-routine operations. The safe execution of routine operations must be controlled by the company's own safety management system. Each non-routine operation must be verified and approved by shore-based management after the application of a careful risk assessment process. With flammable or toxic cargoes, tanks and working spaces must be tested for the presence of flammable or toxic vapour. Cargoes of this type must be loaded in closed conditions where the tanks are ventilated only through the gas risers. The same safety precautions must be taken anywhere on board ship where toxic or flammable vapours could accumulate. If operations involve working in enclosed spaces, special work permits must be obtained from a designated officer and the prescribed entry procedures must be strictly followed. Further information on this important subject is available in the series and course Entry into Enclosed Spaces, produced by Videotel. During the voyage, continuous monitoring must be carried out to ensure that each cargo is kept at the correct temperature and, where appropriate, the padding or blanketing of cargoes is adequately maintained. Some cargoes may need to be carried at a specific temperature to maintain specification and discharged at a higher temperature to aid efficient stripping. 
there may be other operational requirements listed in the Certificate of Fitness in the case of a reactive cargo. Butyl acrylate may react with itself if the applied inhibitor is below the required level for the duration of the voyage. If this happens, the cargo could solidify in the pipeline or in the tank vents, or even the tanks, preventing discharge. The ship's operator or the charterer's agent will have communicated all the cargo details prior to arriving at the discharge port. This will have included the requirements for tank washing and any other information which has a bearing on the operation of the ship, the port or the surrounding environment. The unloading of any chemicals must be in accordance with regulations laid down in the relevant codes and in the ship's P&A manual. All procedures involved must be agreed between the port authorities and the master. These will include the conditions for discharge to commence, the starting time, the rate of discharge, purging of the lines, and dealing with any contaminated washing medium. Of course, the ship must be prepared to receive the cargoes and one vital element of this process is to ensure that the tanks are absolutely clean and free from any residue of the previous cargo or the contaminated washing medium. This is to avoid future cargo contamination. MARPOL Annex 2 regulates the washing requirements of all tanks which have contained X, Y or Z cargoes, including any pre-wash condition. Furthermore, the regulations extend to the methods of discharge of the contaminated washing medium. Further information regarding tank washing is contained in part two of this series. Every day, hundreds of cargoes are handled safely without any problems, because the correct safety procedures are followed. But, despite all the precautions, emergencies can arise. For this reason, regular drills should be carried out to practice the appropriate emergency response. Attention all hands, attention all hands. This is a fire drill, this is a fire drill. I say again. In this example, a simulated fight in the incinerator. The latest approach to an emergency involves raising the alarm, mustering and assessing the incident instead of trying to tackle the situation alone. As there could be a number of flammable cargoes aboard a chemical tanker at any one time, responding to a fire effectively is of particular significance. The materials safety data sheets provide the cargo specific emergency measures, whilst the ship's own company emergency manual will list the procedures specific to the ship's design and equipment. Uh, Roger, emergency party. Prepare your PA weather and carry out on-scene evaluation of fire emergency. Everyone working on board must be familiar with these requirements. Bridge, this is support party. Mustered and accounted for, awaiting orders. Roger, support party. Fire outbreak reported at incinerator space. Secure all bent stocks and ventilators. The nature of the emergency will be communicated to everyone on board and the master's specific instructions must be followed exactly. Remember, each cargo has its own specific emergency requirements. Therefore, the response measures taken can be very complex. In this instance, containing the fire and preventing excessive heat buildup in the cargo tanks through boundary cooling is one of the response actions to be put in place. Evaluation indicates fire more Realistic drills by such approach. as this help to ensure that everyone is familiar with the roles they must perform and with the location and function of the emergency equipment and protective clothing. 